Hello and welcome to video 1 for week 10. In week 9 we started extending derivatives to the idea of multivariable functions of scalar fields. We introduced the partial derivative and the gradient as the two first extensions. In this week we're going to talk about different ways of conceptually extending the derivative and by the end of the week I'm hoping to tie them all together to give a bit of a holistic notion of what the derivative ought to mean for a scalar field. We're going to start with directional derivatives today. So we have the notion of a partial derivative as the rate of change in a particular variable. But if I move in a variable, I can think of that as moving in an axis direction in space. So if I'm working in R3, the partial del f del x is change in the x variable, but it's equivalently change moving in the x direction. So moving in the x variable is just moving in the direction of the x axis. Likewise, change in y is the change in the y variable. Well, it's the same as moving in the y direction. Change in z is the change in z variable. It's the same as moving in the z direction. Uh, if I'm thinking in R2, because I can draw it easily, I can move in the x direction, I can move in the y direction. But those are not the only directions I can move. I can move in all sorts of other directions as well. Why can't I ask for the rate of change in these directions? That's what leads us to the notion of a directional derivative. So say I have a scalar field and I have a vector which has length one unit vector. We use unit vectors to indicate direction. So this vector u is going to indicate direction. Again, we think of these as local directions. So I have some point and I have some vector of length one as a local direction vector starting from that point. So I can ask for the rate of change of the scalar field f in the direction u. The notation here is d subscript u. And this is given by a limit definition, which looks very much like all the limit definitions we've had so far for derivatives. We evaluate at some point v, so this derivative at some point v. We move in the direction u, but we only move a little bit. And we take the limit as that movement goes to zero. So that's going to give us then the infinitesimal change, rate of change, if we move infinitesimally in the u direction. This does in fact recover the partial derivatives we had before. If we move in the x or y or z direction in R3, we do in fact get the partials del f del x, del f del y, and del f del z. But we also now have the flexibility of moving in whatever direction we want. Now this limit definition is not nice to work with, so I would much prefer to have a better way to calculate this. Luckily I do. So again, the same setup, I have a scalar field, I have a unit local direction that I'm trying to differentiate in. What is the rate of change of that scalar field in the direction u? It can be calculated by taking the dot product of the local direction u with the gradient. Gradient we already know how to calculate. It is the vector of partial derivatives. So this is a relatively efficient way to calculate the directional derivative. And as I said last week, almost all of the calculations will eventually boil down to calculating partial derivatives, and that is also true here. The gradient is the vector of partial derivatives, so we need to calculate the vector of partial derivatives and then take the dot product with this particular unit vector. I can ask for the magnitude of this rate of change. So this rate of change is a scalar, it's a dot product, but it could be positive or negative. But if I look for the absolute value of it, this is going to be the length of the vector u times the length of the gradient multiplied by the cosine between them. This was an identity we had for the dot product earlier in the term. The length of u is just 1, so that goes away. Multiplying by 1 doesn't do anything. And I get the length of the gradient, which is fixed, multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the local direction and the gradient. And this is a bit of a proof of a thing that I mentioned last week, that the gradient points in the direction of maximal change. So in R2, if I have some point here, say the gradient points this way, which means that the negative gradient points this way, and say this is temperature, that means that the temperature is going to increase most quickly this way, and the temperature is going to decrease most quickly if I move this way. And for these other directions that I can move, well, they have some angle theta between them and the gradient, and that's going to tell me basically how quickly they are increasing or decreasing the magnitude of that rate of change. I want to calculate some examples, and I've chosen some slightly complicated functions, so the calculations get a little bit intense, but I wanted to use these functions because I think they're a little bit interesting. So here is sine of x squared plus y squared. This is sort of a uh, a ripples on a pond kind of function. We have these concentric circles going out and the cross section of those is a sine wave. So what I'm thinking about here is I'm thinking about choosing any point 
and then from that point moving in some direction determined by a direction in R2 below that point. So the directions are all determined um, sitting below this point moving in R2. And I can ask for what the rate of change is in various directions. So if I go up here, then I'm going up my graph, I should have a positive rate of change. Here going down, I should have a negative rate of change. It's quite steep. Here going across, it looks like I have a slightly positive rate of change. Uh, and here going across, maybe I have a slightly positive or slightly negative rate of change. And I can do this at all sorts of points. I've got all these points here. And at different points in different directions, I can have different rates of change. And this is what really what the directional derivative is trying to capture, is this notion of sitting at some point in the graph and looking in some direction. And depending on the point, depending on the direction, we could be looking up a slope, we could be looking down a slope. If we're here and we look this way, we could have a flat rate of change looking sort of directly across a ridge. All sorts of things are possible. So that calculation means I need to calculate the partial derivatives, which are the same thing as the directional derivatives in the axis direction. So this thing is just calculating the partial derivative dx. This is calculating the partial derivative of dy. And then if I choose some other direction, uh, unit vector 1 over root 2, 2, 1 over root 5, 2 over root 5, then what I need to do is I need to take the dot product of this with the gradient, which has these components. So take the dot product of this vector and the vector with these two things, I get this expression. And then if I wanted to evaluate it at a particular point, so at some point root pi root pi, I'll put root pi root pi in for x and y, and I'll get this expression, which I can simplify down to 6 root pi over 5. So that tells me that root pi root pi is some point in the graph in where the direction 1 over root 5, 2 over root 5, is actually giving me a fairly substantially positive rate of change. So from this point, looking in this direction, I must be looking up a slope. I must be looking at a direction that has a fairly quickly increasing rate of change. Let me do one more example. This is a very similar function. I've now adjusted this function by an exponential decay term. So this is a little bit more even like ripples on a pond, where the ripples get smaller as we go out. So same thing. I can look at any points on this graph. And from these points, I can look at different directions and ask for the rate of change in all those various directions. That's what the directional derivative is doing. Uh, here's the calculation. I'm not going to go through all the details of it. But if I'm looking in some direction a, b, I need to take the dot product with the partial derivative. This whole thing is the partial derivative in x. This whole thing is the partial derivative in y. So I multiply the partial derivative in y times the first, or the nx times the first component, multiply the partial derivative in y times the second component. And if I want to evaluate it at a point, I will replace all the x's and y's with that point. So in this case, I could evaluate it at a point, simplify it down to this expression, where a, b, again, is some direction from this point, root pi, root pi, on that curve. And I see this is, this is a little bit different from the previous example, which makes sense because I now have this exponential decay. I'm getting a large term in the denominator, which is going to lead to smaller and smaller rates of change. And that makes sense because this graph that I showed here has smaller rates of change, has less steep rates of change, particularly as I go further out compared with the previous example. And that's really the whole notion I'm trying to get at with these examples, this idea that I can be at some point and I can have some directions from those points, and that tells me how I go along the complicated contours of these graphs.